Well, today we are joined by Eric Snodgrass, Science Fellow and Principal Atmospheric Scientist for Nutrient Ag Solutions. Eric, just kind of going into it right here on just latest developments, uh, can we talk about that La Nina weather pattern and those developments? I, if we're on that third year now, that is very unusual and just kind of bring us into where that puts us at right now in long range. Yeah, that's going to be front of mind, I think, for a lot of folks is what are the risks associated with the La Nina? So we better just dive in and take a look at it. So first thing I want to share with you all is our current sea surface temperature map. And as you just take a close look here, we can see that we have a large area out here in the Central Pacific that's still got some cold water. And that's always the symptom. That just tells me that the atmosphere has given us strong trade winds and the North Pacific is kind of playing along. So you see the cold water along the coast. That's part of a signal we call the negative PDO. In a nutshell, when we've got colder water off the West Coast and colder water in the Central Pacific, we tend to see two different things happening. It really increases the risk of drought development in the midsection of the country. And also what this tends to do is it tends to later on in the year, like late summer to fall, give us an increased risk of hurricane activity. So it's kind of a double whammy here, one being too much water, the other being too dry. Now these aren't slam dunks, right? They don't guarantee these things, but they're just risk factors going forward. But a lot of different uh, research groups, of course, look at it. The latest came out from NOAA. This is their 2022 hurricane season outlook. This released a couple of days ago. Last year, they gave a 60% chance of being above average, and we were well above average. And this year, they got a 65% chance. So just like every other major forecasting group, they're looking at about 14 to 21 named storms. Um, average would be 14. So you can see that we're, we're going to be above average there. We've actually already seen a little bit of tropical activity, though, by the way. Just take a look at this. Now, this was valid through uh, this morning here uh, on the 26th. All this wet weather you see down here coming out of the Florida Panhandle to Alabama, Georgia, through the Appalachian Mountains, there was actually a little tropical disturbance that came up through this area. It wasn't named, it was just something we were watching, but put down four, five, six inches of rain in places. The other big piece of this is how wet things have been back here in the Central Plains. Now, this is an area that's been deep in drought. And yeah, some of this has come through in the terms of big time severe weather, but this part of our cotton belt, hardware winter wheat belt, of course, we got a lot of corn, soybean, sorghum, other things in here. This was some needed rain, although I don't think we wanted that much. Just take a look at my color bar. That's over six inches uh, in total cumulative precip. But this is an area that we've been watching be in drought for a while, right? So our latest drought monitor came out here on Thursday, the 26th. Still shows us that over the last couple of months, we've deepened the drought here in western Texas, parts of the Panhandles, western Kansas, and then to Colorado and New Mexico. But where the droughts really changed a lot has been in this area. We've really beat it back into these areas. Um, my biggest concern going forward is we're still seeing some of the climate models want to bring that drought back into the western corn belt. I'll show you that in just a second. But uh, first thing to take a look at here, let's go take a look at those reservoir conditions in California where they're in drought as well. Some of the big ones like Shasta and Oroville. 40% of full pool at Shasta, 54% at Oroville, well below the historical averages, which means the very dry conditions that California endured since January have put them into a pretty rough spot in terms of water availability uh, as we go forward here. So soil moisture, just have a look. That's the haves and the have nots. We need to be watching to see if drought conditions redevelop kind of to the west of that line while it's been very wet to the east and extremely wet in North Dakota, getting into Southern Manitoba and parts of kind of the, the, the upper Midwest and through here. And by the way, if you want a stat to add to this, since April 1st, every number that you see represents a rank on the 130 years worth of data. So from the Northwest of the Northern Plains, skipping this one part of Montana, we've seen extremely wet conditions. So you see, this is the setup. This is where we've been. That's been dry South and wet North. And you wanna know why? The jet streams come in just like that. So on one side, you have the drier conditions, and on the other side, we have the wetter, and that's been the setup going forward. And we know what that's done to planting delays. So we start thinking about where this takes us in the longer term, and uh, I want to show you a couple of, of maps here. This is from NOAA. This is their outlook on precipitation compared to normal for June, July, August. So there's concern about the redevelopment of drought in the plains getting up into Montana, partly into the western Corn Belt here where they're looking at very wet conditions over parts of the Southeast to the Mid-Atlantic. And there's a lot of reasons for this, but it all has to do with the setup of those ocean temperatures, what they mean about the atmosphere. But if we go up here and take a look at the, 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 the three months to slide it forward one, this is now July, August, September, this is gonna be front of mind for a lot of growers going forward. That is that NOAA's still kind of bullseyeing parts of the Western Corn Belt with, with, with increased risk on drought development later on this summer. 
So yeah, you ask uh, what's going on and what are we looking forward to? I've got my hands full right now, just staring at all these things, trying to fit the pieces together, remembering that we're looking in the long term, which means a lot of this is speculative, but it's still an important part of the story. And farmers are also going to have their hands full on that. But looking at the shorter term, you're talking about the haves and the have nots, but right now, a little bit of those northern parts are getting a break from rain, but we're talking about some possible rain here in the upcoming forecast. Can you show us what's going on there? Yeah, you know, the northern plains need a big break, but the problem is actually seen by looking at the jet stream level winds. So in my neck of the woods, I live down here in Illinois, I don't like this guy right here sitting and spinning over St. Louis right now. That cutoff low is just going to move slowly toward the east, but what's behind it is given the big push. This is this kind of extended branch of the jet stream. And what we end up getting out of that is this. This is the European model uh, looking at the next 15 days, all in aggregate. And when you look at this, you see the drier conditions showing up eventually here. But with that jet stream coming into the northwest and then moving through the northern plains, we're going to reintroduce more rainfall into this area, a place that needs to have about 15 to 20 days of drier weather without the wind, without the heat to get things going. But unfortunately, we just we just don't see that fully kind of pouring through that area just now. So I'm going to be watching out for them uh, after the weekend. This is just my forecast graphic I generated for May 29 to June 2nd. Severe weather in the upper Midwest and a lot of wet weather, including look at that, more snow in the northern Rockies. Okay, thinking about all of that, if we uh, if we kind of play this forward and just stitch it together, I love these maps, European model, the color shading, you see the bar down here, tells you the probability of being an inch of rain in the next 10 days. So there's going to be some really wet weather coming through this, this particular uh, region as we, as we kind of stretch it out here. What I do notice is that even into the beginning of June, this is June 7th, you see this blue here and the warmer colors to the south? That's a trough north of a ridge, and the jet stream just screams in between the two, which means in the near term, I don't see a slowdown necessarily in this pattern as we work through that first week of June. At some point, we got to be on the lookout for that block that could set us up with that drought risk, which we, you know, we talked about right here, but it's not in the near term. Uh, what is in the near term? Take a look at these temperatures. Here's today's highs on Thursday. By Friday into Saturday, look at the heat pouring back into the mid part of the country as a broad ridge opens up and really warms this area up and helps to dry this area back out. But all the actions always in between, right? So in between where the hot and cold air are, and that's what's gonna send into the weekend and early next week, all the inclement weather to the Northern Plains where they're worried about highs getting out of the 50s, all right? Beyond that, as I said, the pattern's open and moving. So day five through 10, that's that first week of June, getting into day 10 through 15, which gets us out to the 10th of June, the cool air is moving. It's not like it's just staying put. So overall, I don't see the pattern getting blocked up too much just yet, but that kind of gives us a rundown of our next couple of weeks here. And just some crop talk here with that. I mean, we're starting to get some emergences on corn and soybeans. Are we looking at, you know, some, a little bit of risk or a little bit milder temperatures and whatnot to at least, you know, keep us up with decent conditions moving forward? Yeah, I'd say that the greatest risk is north. That's where they're going to struggle to bring in sustained heat to get the crop to just pop out, plus to get the conditions right to get the crop planted. But if I was in the central and eastern corn belt or in the cotton belt, this forecast is relatively favorable overall for emergence, early vegetative stages of those crops moving forward. And thank God we're finally behind our last, I think, risk for frost. It should be, right? We're at the end of May. That conversation should have ended about 15, 20 days ago, but we had some frost ding the Western Corn Belt last weekend. Yeah, and it looked like some of that didn't, you know, come out to be as bad as what some people were thinking. So we're quite thankful on that one. Absolutely. But moving away from us and talking about South America, who is actually finishing up their crop season as far as growing with that corn, can you talk about a little bit of where we're sitting at right now as far as when they're starting to get in the field, hopefully for harvest soon. Yeah, so the dry season has started, which means the monsoon shut down. It won't start again until mid-September, but it's what happened up until the monsoon shut down that I wanna show you here. So you're looking at a map from March 21st to May 20th, so a two month drought indicator map. If you just think about it, this is Mato Grosso, so well north of a third of the soybean crop, or excuse me, the corn crop is grown here. But a lot of that safrina crop did finish under drier conditions. And we keep seeing some of the, the big uh, you know, estimates peeling back million metric ton at a time on, on the size of this safrina crop. Uh, where it still needs to finish is in southern Brazil. And they just had down here uh, last week temperatures where the overnight lows were in the mid-30s. 
which isn't good for that crop either. I don't think they had a widespread frost, but it certainly got cold, which slowed some things down. So that's just another kind of ding against the global balance sheet in that Brazil did not, of course, have a big uh, soybean crop off about 25 million metric ton. And now we start to see that the, the Safrina corn crop was probably peeled, peeled back five to seven million metric ton as well from earlier estimates. So those are the main stories I got for South America. Well, it's great to have you back on here, Eric. And we, once again, we really appreciate you talking to us. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for having me on.